feel free to jump in at any point in time and discuss primarily after John, Michael and um, Richard are done talking. Um, we'll break out into groups and in those groups, um, what would be good, so we had some primer questions. We'll, there'll be somebody from all of our groups there. The first question is to ask them if they, you know, what they heard, um, what they may have learned, like what, do they know anybody with a spinal cord injury? Um, you know, what is their experience uh, and or friends or, or, you know, did they hear it, something different or, or do they understand, is there, do they have questions about anything? Um, and I think that'll start a little bit of talk and then talk about if you're comfortable um, with your lived experience or, you know, people you know, um, and you'll find the, the last questions, I think, as you get going and if people are comfortable in the small rooms. The goal is just to talk about around the quality of life needs, what's out there, like what, what are the small little problems? What are the big problems? Uh, just to get people comfortable with the idea of talking about spinal cord injuries in those small groups. We have allocated about 20 to 30 minutes in, that, in those small groups. My experience has been that if the conversation starts, 20 minutes is gonna fly by in a second. Um, but that's the real focus is to try and build conversation and connections um, and an understanding of, of the space. Yeah, and I think that maybe Joseph, right before we go into breakout rooms, me and you, we can just go over what the objectives of the breakout room, what the role of the facilitators are, um, just so that everybody's, um, you know, familiar and ready to go. Absolutely. That's, that was part of the plan. Um, so why don't we start letting everybody in then and uh, we'll go from there. Yes, I think it's a good idea. Before we start that, can, does anyone have any questions or any concerns right now that they want to get out there? No. Everybody's good to go? Or All right. Not. Cool. I'd say break a leg, but I'd say break a laptop or an arm or something. Go. <laughs> All right. And we have chat rooms too. Good afternoon, everybody. Afternoon. We have about um, 60 people here joining us today. So it's going to be hopefully a, a great, small, tiny little conversation. You, you in, in the end, you can take out my beans and put a little water and warm it. Only I will eat it. Okay, so let's talk about the initial little ground rules. I would ask everybody that's not uh, speaking at the time to please uh, mute your mics. Um, we highly encourage people to turn on your cameras um, in these days of, of uh, pandemic, sometimes even having a face that you can see and as opposed to a black box is, is helpful and means a lot to some people. Um, it's a little bit humanizing. Um, so if you are comfortable, please feel free to turn on your cameras. So we're, we're trying to make this a, as a human an experience as possible. Um, if you have issues or, or um, reservations about that, uh, please feel free. In small groups, you should feel more comfortable when we do break out. Um, so I wanna welcome everybody and um, we're going to be starting in a minute, um, just waiting a little bit to let some of the people that have, um, that are a little late. We have been oversubscribed. We were hoping to sort of have this workshop at about 50 people. We have 69 in the room at the moment already. 
um, and probably a few more to come. Um, I wanted to start by welcoming everyone and um, it's really exciting. Um, this is the first of our um, six workshops and the goal of these workshops is to, is to sort of enrich the experience of the Praxis Challenge. The Praxis Challenge is, uh, and I'll get into that in a second, um, it's a pilot to try and inspire innovation, um, to come up with uh, ideas, refine, develop existing ideas so that we can move them towards um, sustainable, commercializable uh, products that help improve the quality of life for people living with spinal cord injuries. Um, so today we're gonna to have really three main activities. Um, my name is Joseph Fehrenbach and I will be starting by providing a very high level brief overview of innovation and the pathway that we're going to be talking about over these workshops. And um, I'm going to aim to do that in 10, 15 minutes, since we're already starting a couple minutes late. Um, and then I'm gonna hand over the, the discussion to John, Michael, and Richard, who are gonna talk about the lived experience uh, with uh, spinal cord injuries. When we're done that, we're going to then break out into smaller groups to talk about the things that we have heard, uh, different people's experiences, and um, to talk a little bit about the needs and the space so that we are ready for next week when we start talking about how do we define our projects um, and, and, and ideas. So with that, um, I'd like to ask Jillian, uh, the program director for the Praxis Innovation Challenge, um, to provide us with a land acknowledgement statement. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, so the land acknowledgement statement is the City of Toronto acknowledges that we are on traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishabig, uh, the Chippewa, and the and the Wendat Pills and is now home to many diverse nations, uh, many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Thank you. Um, so for those of you joining us for the first time, the, uh, the Praxis Innovation Challenge is uh, first time doing this. So bear with us through the it, we're, we're really modeling the iterate and ideate function of innovation. We're going to stumble, we're going to fall, we're going to get up and learn from it and make the next round better. Um, what we're challenging all of you and people who participate is to come up with ideas, come up with or take ideas that you already have and develop them in order to demonstrate a transformative commercializable concept to improve the quality of life of people living with spinal cord injuries. That's the challenge. It's very broad. Um, and that we hope that we will work with you throughout the next several months to refine whatever you've been working on, or if you haven't been working on anything, to come up with some ideas uh, to test out and to, um, to develop throughout this process. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, the Praxis Spinal Cord Institute for supporting and providing the backing for this innovation challenge. I would also like to acknowledge our partners in this, um, the uh, four academic institutions, uh, Simon Fraser University, University of Calgary, University of Toronto, and University of Waterloo who have um, taken the plunge into experimenting with something that's a little different and a little new and a little rough around the edges, but also very exciting. All right, I assume we have most of our people here and 
without further ado then, if you guys don't mind, I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenge um, and then move into um, to what you guys actually came here for. So the way that we've designed this challenge, um, this process and roadmap for innovation is around um, the innovation key, which is this diagram um, that you see, and we will discuss sort of how it can help us move our ideas forward. Um, this doesn't have to be the only way to do ideation, but it, it'll help provide us with a frame and a, and a common language to talk about. The way that we've structured things is that the first step is to identify a need. And that's very important because the approach here is intended to be human centric. People are at the very center of all innovation. Um, and our goal is that if at the end of the day, we're not actually helping people, we're missing the mark. So I'm gonna talk a little bit for the next five, 10, maybe 15 minutes about what is innovation for those of you that are new to the space. Um, we have uh, people in the audience that are um, old school hacks at innovation, as well as people that are brand new to thinking about some of these issues. So. Um, let's start talking about some definitions. Um, the way that we want to sort of look at uh, innovation here is that it is the practical implementation of ideas to create something that is uh, new or improved. Not all innovations are necessarily disruptive or completely different or change everything we know about life. Some are very small but they're improvements on things that we're already doing that help life tremendously. So when we talk about innovation, it is really about how do we uh, move ideas forward that will help improve something or will develop something new that will help people. The goal of most innovations or many innovations, at least the successful ones, is that they usually um, address a need, uh, people's needs um, that are unmet. So to do something better, easier, faster, uh, more convenient, um, all of these are things that help us to develop ideas, products, policies, goods, services, um, just about anything that, uh, that addresses what people want. And where do innovations come from? Well, the reality is just about anywhere. Um, the way we will look at it in terms of our key is that there's really um, a couple directions. When it comes to academe, the innovations tend to come from discovery or research. And one of the biggest challenges that sometimes we have is that in academe, academics, clinicians start with their idea or their research and they wanna just force it into uh, an area without actually looking, is it needed? Does it make sense? And so it's usually called a knowledge push where because I have this solution, I'm gonna find a problem into which I'm gonna make it happen. Um, and so quite often when you start from this direction, it is incredibly important that you actually go back and say, is there a human need for this? Is there a desire? Is there a space that I can position this in? The other way is that there's a pull. And the pull is that there are people out there that have a particular need and you develop your idea or your innovation to address their needs. And this has been used successfully lately in the lean uh, startup model, where the mantra is know your audience, uh, know your people, uh, know your market as soon as humanly possible. You go out and you do your research with people first before you start investing in developing everything. So you have a clear niche, a clear need identified to move things forward. So how do we have impact? Well, it, the goal here is to help people. Uh, with health innovation, it's, it's quite often to help people in, in health spaces. 
And so it's kind of, it's an obvious thing that we want to solve people's needs, compelling needs. Um, and it's very surprising how quite often that's not really the, the, the first thing people talk about. I'm sure many of you have seen those uh, Dragon's Dens episodes on, on TV where you have an innovator saying, oh, I, I've been doing this for four years. I'm sure this is the best thing since sliced bread. I've spent all of my savings I, um, and everything on it. You, all I need is an investment from you of X number of dollars and it will be the best once I convince people. Well, that's what we're speaking to right now is that understanding the need first before developing the product or, or shaping it is quite important. Um, and so when we talk about needs, it's referring to this concept that uh, in the late 40s, early 50s, Maslow developed that as people, we want or require something and it's a motivation for action. Um, and so there are different kinds of needs, the way that Maslow defined it, uh, physiological needs, safety, belonging, um, self-actualization. There are different ways to understand these needs. So you can think of things as uh, you know, perceived needs, hidden or latent needs, um, and they vary in intensity. When you're in the desert and you're parched, your need for water is going to be much more intense than if you are swimming in a freshwater stream. So they're very contextual and understanding the needs and the people that have them is very much key in defining the problems and the, the, requ the design requirements that you will need to develop an idea. Um, so an easy way and a way that we'll talk a little bit more about throughout this process to, um, to look at needs is what's called a gap analysis. Um, it's basically looking at what is the current state? What are we doing now? Versus what do we wish to have happen? What's a future or a desired state? And how the gap in between is the need. Um, the need is usually caused uh, by multiple gaps in the system that are caused by multiple little barriers in the system that are problems that, that stop us from doing whatever it is that people want, people need. And so they help us to look at how do we define an action, an intervention to develop a solution to try and get across that problem and move towards and innovation. And so that's the perspective that we're going to take. Um, and uh, the innovation key, if you look at the first part of it, whether you're starting with a discovery, whether you're starting with a gap, some missing technology, ingenuity gap in engineering, or an idea, the first thing you need to do is move towards identifying a strong, compelling need. There's some questions which we'll talk about. The, what makes it hard or makes it challenging is there are different types of needs. And you have to be able to um, work together with people and work through with the people you're trying to help to understand where are the priorities and where do you focus? Whose need is it? Which need? And how do you identify these needs? Sometimes one person will have a very specific need that is not generalizable to a group that you might be trying to develop something for. So understanding how you get there is important. This is a very, uh, I'm almost done, so very quick schematic of how we're gonna sort of address this in the coming weeks um, is starting, if you have an idea um, and you already have the idea, then the key is to go and verify, make sure that that need is real, not just your bias, or assumption or in your head that actually real people, people out there are going to say, yes, indeed, this is something that makes sense. And we would pay money or we would do this is there's a lot of, there's drive for it. If you don't have an idea, then you need to identify a need. And once you establish an area to look for, 
the process is very similar. It's primary research, talking to people. What are your needs? What are your challenges every day? And these, this discovery, this kind of um, design research or probing can be done through a number of different ways, uh, direct observation, contextual inquiry, focus groups, interviews, just going out and talking to people, talking to five people and asking them, what are your needs to get an idea of where you're going and, and to uh, curb your biases and assumptions. Once you generate a list, you need to prioritize that, that list. Again, quite often talking, um, finding out, triangulating, selecting the need that you want to work with. And there are some design uh, strategies that you can use to select the need. Once you make sure that it's the one you want to work on, you go on and start defining and framing your problem. There are a lot of tools we'll talk about, empathy maps, journey maps, et cetera, et cetera, for all this. Um, and we'll tackle some of that in our next workshop next week. Um, without further ado, I would like to call on John, Richard, and Michael to talk about living with uh, spinal cord injuries. We are very, very fortunate to have three incredible presenters share their experiences with us. Over to you, John. Thanks so much, Joseph. Uh, that was a fantastic overview of, of how ideas come to life and, and how they, um, you know, how, how to address needs as opposed to just uh, creating things and, and hoping that they can find a need for them. Um, <clears throat> so, Today, what we're going to do, uh, myself, uh, Richard Peter, and Michael Garten, is just sort of go into a little more depth about what spinal cord injury actually is and, and how it affects individuals. Um, so I'm going to go through, uh, for those of you that joined us on February 22nd, uh, I'm going to rehash a few slides from that meeting, but, but go into a little bit more depth for you all. Um, to give you a better and deeper understanding of what spinal cord injury is and how it affects individuals, um, not just physiologically, but but just in their in their life in general. Um, and so we'll go through that over about ten minutes, and then we're going to have an open discussion between the three of us um, and explain to you, you know, how we all have spinal cord injuries, but the way that they affect us is a little bit different. So just to to hopefully provide you guys some perspective. Um, and once we've sort of opened up that that idea um, and had that discussion. Uh, as Joseph said earlier, we're gonna, we've got a, a group of, of great individuals living with spinal cord injury that are gonna facilitate breakout rooms with each of you. Um, and so we'll split into these breakout rooms uh, where you'll have a, an individual living with spinal cord injury that you can speak with, that you can ask questions to, that can provide their, their perspective and their context um, and maybe provide you some feedback on some ideas that you might have. So um, we're hopeful that um, by the time we get to the, uh, the end of this workshop, that everybody here will have a really, really solid understanding of what spinal cord injury is and how it affects people and, and how uh, innovations and technologies and adaptations can really um, enhance people's lives and, and how it's such a, a ready market um, and, and how uh, opportunities to, to address issues with spinal cord injury um, are, are, are really um, welcome and that there's opportunities for, for an even larger market outside of spinal cord injury. So anyways, without any further ado, Joseph, can you jump to the next slide, please? <coughs> All right, so where's the need? Um, this is a, a graphic um, from our organization, the Praxis Spinal Cord Institute, that really captures some of the, the, the impact of spinal cord injury um, from a systems perspective. Um, so some basic facts, you know, it is a relatively rare condition. We estimate there's uh, around 86,000 people living in Canada with spinal cord injury, uh, and we have uh, about 4,500 new cases each year. Um, those sound like really big numbers, but in the grand scheme of things, when you put that next to cancer or heart disease, it's actually quite small. Um, but I'll explain to you a little bit later how the market is actually larger than it looks. Um, the primary causes of injury uh, are falls, motor vehicle crashes, and high velocity impacts from sport, assault, and other. Um, you know, I think tra traditionally spinal cord injury was, was often considered to be what they call the young man's injury um, because young men are traditionally high risk taking individuals 
uh, and it tended to be that, that it was younger men that, that, that were um, getting spinal cord injuries. I myself am a perfect example of that, having had my spinal cord injury at 16. But now we're seeing a change in demographics. Um, it's now sort of bimodal, where you're still seeing those young risk takers that are getting spinal cord injuries, but you're also seeing a, a large population of aging individuals. So people in their 50s, 60s, or 70s that are getting spinal cord injuries almost at the same rate as younger people are. Um, and that's what we call, you know, low impact injuries. So, you know, falling when you're putting up the Christmas lights or slipping on the ice, or, you know, even people that are still leading highly active lives uh, as they get into their later years, you know, um, you know, body surfing or, or mountain biking. So um, it's not just a young person's injury. Uh, and it's very costly to the medical system. Um, you know, we're, we're talking for, for newly injured people that, that 4,300 people per year, just the, the new traumatic spinal cord injuries is about 2.7 billion in direct healthcare costs each year. And then you've got that ongoing lifetime care because once you've had your spinal cord injury, you've gone through that acute stabilization and rehabilitation, you returned out to the community, the costs don't end there. The added costs of living with a spinal cord injury for somebody with quadriplegia, tetraplegia, um, can be three, maybe more million. I think um, some recent estimates out of the United States puts it as high as $5 million a year for high level, or $5 million in a lifetime uh, for high tetraplegia. Um, so, so really quite an expensive injury um, to the healthcare system and to the individual. Um, and then, you know, these rehospitalization rates, um, need for specialized care and home care services are exponentially higher for persons with spinal cord injury uh, and life expectancy as a result of spinal cord injury is, is also severely diminished. So you can see in terms of, of dollars, um, it's, it's really quite a costly injury. Next slide, please. But beyond those financial costs, there's also a huge cost to the individual. Um, we touched on this a little bit uh, a few weeks ago, but I'll, I'll just add into that. You know, we talked about those, those costs of care, you know, and for a lot of people, that means hiring somebody, a professional uh, care provider to come into their home um, to, to help them get out of bed in the morning, to help them, you know, use the washroom or, or have a shower, um, to help them feed or dress themselves. Uh, and again, at the end of the day, so, you know, oftentimes these are done by, by hired professionals. And a lot of times that burden just falls on the family. Uh, it can be your, your partner, your wife or your husband, uh, your children, your parents. Um, so there's a huge increase in burden on, on families and communities. Um, I think we're all aware of the accessibility challenges um, that, that we deal with in Canada. Luckily in Canada, we have a very high standard of, uh, of accessibility in the built environment uh, compared to some other parts of the planet. But, but even still there's, you know, day to day, you know, I encounter these barriers uh, in the physical environment um, and, and it's, uh, it, it continues to be a problem throughout Canada and around the world. Um, we talked about reduced unemployment. Unemployment amongst persons with disabilities is bordering on 70%. When you think that the national average of unemployment is around 7%, that'll tell you, you know, that um, there's a highly underutilized resource. And the problem is, is, is when you're unemployed, you're often on fixed income. There's a lot of disincentives built into our structures to return to employment, whether you're living on, on government social supports or work safe or, or some sort of insurance um, a settlement, you know, and that leads to reduced social um, connection, you know, um, and as well, you know, a real reduction in disposable income, which means you know, your ability to go on vacation or go to the restaurant or, or to purchase, you know, the, the, the wants and needs of life is, uh, is severely limited. Um, you know, this relocation to urban centers is another major issue, you know, outside of the major urban centers, you know, uh, Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, Calgary, you know, when you start to get into rural and remote areas, the physical accessibility diminishes significantly, as well as the expertise uh, from a clinical standpoint that is needed, um, specialized expertise for, for managing living with a spinal cord injury is often uh, not available in rural and remote areas. And so a lot of people living with spinal cord injury are, are really forced 
to relocate to these urban centers where these um, accessibility and, and, and specialized care is available. Next slide, please. Oh, let's try going the other direction. There we go. Um, so yeah, so let's uh, to delve a little deeper, you know, now that we understand a bit about the cost not just to um, you know, our, our economic and, and, and healthcare systems, but also to the individual. Let's, um, let's delve a little deep, deeper into what uh, a spinal cord injury actually does to the human body and to the people that are living with it. Next slide. Uh, so I told you guys uh, a few weeks ago that, that every spinal cord injury is unique. Um, and I can tell you that uh, over 27 years of living with a spinal cord injury, I have met thousands of individuals living with spinal cord injuries. I've never met two people that had identical injuries. Um, you know, everyone has its little differences. You know, you may be injured at the exact same level with the exact same severity. And one person may have no neuropathic pain whatsoever. And another person may have very severe neuropathic pain. One person may be dealing with significant urinary tract infections and another might not. Um, you know, and the severity of the injury fluctuates a lot as well now with advances in acute care and first response, we're seeing a lot more incomplete injuries. And so how that severity of the injury presents itself is also different. Um, you know, I just explained to, to somebody earlier today about the spinal cord and the spinal column and how the spinal cord passes down through the spinal column and dependent at the level of injury, um, it's going to severely uh, alter the, the impact to which parts of your body you're able to functionally use. Um, but we'll get into a little bit more depth with that in, in a moment. I did mention about complete and incomplete injuries. Uh, maybe I'll take this moment here just to explain what that means. Um, for those of you that are not familiar with spinal cord injury, you may have heard somebody say in the past that, that somebody severed their spinal cord. Uh, well, I'm gonna tell you that severing a spinal cord is, is exceptionally rare. Uh, it almost never happens. The only way that you're actually going to sever a spinal cord, which, you know, in another way of saying would be to transect it or to completely slice through it, uh, would be if an object actually passed through the spinal column. Um, and, and that is exceedingly rare. Um, even things like gunshot wounds, which often lead to paralysis, um, don't actually, the, the bullet itself doesn't actually touch the spinal cord. It's it's that secondary shock wave that causes the damage to the spinal cord more often than not. Um, so what often happens is that, you know, through some sort of impact, there's a damage to the spine, the vertebrae break, there's bruising and swelling, um, and the circulation in and out of the, the nerves of the spinal cord is reduced or, or completely impaired. And what ends up happening is that blood and oxygen and, and uh, nutrients can't get into those cells waste products can't get out of those cells. And in the end, those cells just die. Um, and once they die, they never regenerate. Um, but often there's spared tissue um, that's still connected. Um, and with that sparing of tissue, and you know, as I said earlier about the advancements in, in first response and acute care, we're seeing more and more that people who have spared tissue actually have spared function. And that's what we call an incomplete injury. A complete injury would be where you have no sensation or function that's clinically measurable below the level of injury. And an incomplete one in those various gradings, we, we won't go into too much deep depth about that. It's not particularly well relevant today, but um, often people have uh, residual function below the level of injury, and that would be called an incomplete injury. I hope that made sense. I think I rambled a bit there. Anyways, Joseph, can we go to the next slide? There we go. So um, we talked a lot about motor and sensory function. Uh, I think those are, are self-apparent what they are. That's, that's your ability to move your body and your ability to sense your body. Um, and the third um, sort of part of your nervous system uh, that's, that's relevant to spinal cord injuries is called your autonomic nervous system. Um, and that is the parts of your uh, nervous system that your, your body controls uh, automatically. Um, so that would be things like your bowel and bladder function, your sexual function, your respiratory function, uh, your, um, your temperature regulation, all of which um, for people that have been living with a spinal cord injury for, for you know, a period of maybe a few years, they start to recognize that, that the standing and walking is, stops being their, their top priority. 
And often it's these autonomic functions and autonomic dysfunctions uh, that really come to the forefront as being the most important for people um, in terms of their quality of life. You know, as nice as it would be to, to get up and walk away from a wheelchair, um, to me, it's more important to have increase in, in bowel function, bladder function, sexual function, temperature function. You know, the simple fact of the matter is, is that a hot summer day for a person with a spinal cord injury can be a life-threatening event. You know, the ability to sweat and regulate your body temperature, if you've got a, a spinal cord injury above T6, you may not be able to, to naturally sweat on your own. And a hot day can lead to a life-threatening um, condition. Uh, and vice versa in the winter. You know, if you ever go into a, a tetraplegic's home, you're going to go, man, is it ever warm in here? Because tetraplegics don't shiver. They don't have that, that autonomic function to increase their body heat when they get cold. And so they tend to not want to be outside on cold winter's day. And they tend to keep their homes nice and warm because they can't, uh, they can't regulate up their temperature like that. Um, so anyways, that's, that's a little bit, and we talked about the diff different levels. So this map of an individual you're seeing is called a dermatome map. And this is what's used by clinicians to measure what functions an individual has. And as you can see, dependent on the level of injuries, you work down from cervical through thoracic, lumbar and sacral regions of the spinal cord. Um, that's where you start to have changes in sensation and function as you move down the column uh, and the way it affects the body. Next slide, please. Um, we talked a little bit about some of these secondary health complications. Uh, we talked about these autonomic dysfunctions, uh, but there's also a, a host of other issues that people living with spinal cord injury deal with. And they are very, very prevalent um, from some of our um, risker data, we can say that uh, more than 80% of people living with spinal cord injury have reported at least one of these secondary complications in the last year. Um, and they, they happen quite regularly uh, for all people with spinal cord injury. Um, some of the big ones I want to point out here, pressure injuries. Uh, pressure injuries are, are again, a, a really serious concern. They can be severely debilitating to an individual and can be a life-threatening condition as well. Um, pressure injuries, also known as pressure ulcers, are, are simply non-healing wounds. Um, they happen for a variety of reasons, um, generally from being sat or, or located in pressure with pressure on a particular part of the body for an extended period. Um, and, and really in spinal cord injury, you have a, a trifecta of, of impairments that can lead to severe pressure injuries. That would be a reduce in mobility, a redu redu reduction in circulation, and a reduction in sensation all of which happen in persons with spinal cord injury and all of which can lead to severe pressure injuries. Uh, I mentioned neuropathic pain and spasticity earlier. Again, neuropathic pain is, is a big one. Um, we know from the op opioid crisis how severe um, pain management can be, and not just um, socioeconomically, but, but on the individual themselves and for our communities in general. Uh, and neuropathic pain being, being a bit different than nociceptive pain that we're more familiar with again, is not well managed and can be severely debilitating to people. Um, you know, I think we've touched on a bunch of these. I'll, 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 I'll jump forward to the next slide because we'll talk a, bit, a lot more about these as we move forward. Um, so some of these key challenges that maybe you guys might want to address through this, this ideation challenge is looking at, at ways of managing things like neuropathic pain. As I said, there's no known effective treatment. Um, some of the things that are used are, are opioids, gabapentinoids, and cannabis, uh, and a lot of pain specialists are moving towards meditation and mindfulness. Um, but again, for people that are dealing with severe neuropathic pain, it's a major problem and, and really nothing that's effective in managing it. Um, spasticity, again, is, is you know, um, non-volitional contraction of muscular tissue. So that being, you know, your muscles are, are, are activating without you wanting them to. That can present as either a clonic type spasticity, so a twitching or a tremor like you might see uh, in Parkinson's or maybe you might have experienced it on your eyelid. This can go throughout the entire body. Uh, tonic spasticity, which is a high tone level where muscles are, are in a constant state of tension and they, they don't relax, which can be highly fatiguing and, and reduce um, range of motion. 
uh, or major flexor and extensor spasms where limbs will shoot out or contract very rapidly and very violently uh, and can be quite dangerous. Uh, we talked about um, bladder dysfunction, neurogenic bladder. That's the inability to retain or void naturally, retain urine or void naturally. Uh, again, use of catheters, which can lead to catheter um, acquired urinary tract infections, uh, which can lead to sepsis and high antibiotic youth uh, and, and is quite prevalent, uh, as well as um, bladder distension can lead to things like autonomic dysreflexia, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we talked a little bit about pressure injuries already, uh, so I won't go into more, more depth about that. Bowel dysfunction is a big one. Uh, as I always say, if you get a group of people with spinal cord injuries together and start having a conversation with them, it won't take very long before they start talking about bowel dysfunction. It really is a headache. It's a very understudied area and very poorly addressed. Um, the common solutions for, for bowel dysfunction are, are decades old. Um, and really it's a, a key area for innovation. And I think the spinal cord injury population would really welcome any innovation in this area. Um, currently the, the best methods for managing it are, are you know, uh, laxatives, suppositories, digital stimulation or, or transanal irrigation. Um, you know, and, and really I think there's a lot of dissatisfaction amongst people with spinal cord injury. There's also a lot of current research over the last decade or so looking at microbiome dysbiosis. Uh, I think uh, hopefully most of the people on this call are familiar with what the microbiome is. Um, and as a result of uh, the spinal cord injury, um, there's, there's a lot of evidence to show that there's chronic microbiome dysbiosis, which can lead to reduced immune function in persons with spinal cord injury, as well as a host of other issues. So that's certainly an area of investigation um, that, that could be uh, explored through this challenge. And, you know, um, I think it's a, a, a high area for innovation. Uh, we talked about reduced mobility. There is a, a whole host of solutions for uh, and innovations for mobility and new things coming on the market all the time. I think we're living in a whole new world, the world of lithium, lithium ion. Lithium ion. Uh, and um, I think, you know, you just need to go around and see all the people riding on e-bikes and e-scooters and driving around in Teslas to see that um, power assisted battery controlled innovations are, are really, um, really moving forward. We see this in wheelchair power assists, exoskeletons and other devices. Um, and there's a lot of new devices that have currently come to the market um, or are, are on their way to market. Certainly an exciting area for innovation which can lead to reduced mo or increased mobility and increased uh, independence for, for persons with spinal cord injury and for a whole host of other uh, neurological conditions. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is one which I haven't talked about too much uh, either uh, on the 22nd or today. Autonomic dysreflexia, um, if you're not familiar with this, this is a result of a disconnection between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems in the spinal cord. Uh, it occurs predominantly in people with injuries at the T6 level and above. Uh, it's clinically recognized by a sudden uncontrolled elevation in blood pressure, over 20 milligrams of mercury. Um, and it really is, uh, it, it's something that people deal with and it's quite, um, quite frustrating as something you need to deal with, um, but it's also life-threatening. It can lead to heart attack, it can lead to stroke. Um, and, and it's really potentially life-threatening. And really it's, it's characterized by a noxious stimuli below the level of injury. And this could be something as simple as bowel or bladder distension, distension uh, sexual activity, uh, some sort of injury or infection. Um, and it's, um, it's a big area that could use some innovation. Um, I don't know that much about it, so I'm not, I'm not really an expert, but if this is an area that you're looking at exploring, um, there's a lot of experts out there that could provide you a lot more input on that. Maybe as we move towards the discussion, this will be an area we can talk a bit more about. Uh, and I believe that's my last slide. Maybe we can jump to the next slide. Oh, yeah, one last thing. Small innovations can make a big difference. You know, um, this is uh, an, an ideation challenge. We're looking very early stage. We're trying to create ideas. Um, and I just want you guys to know that you know, it doesn't need to be a huge game changer to make a huge change in a person's life. 
um, small innovations can, can really make a, a huge, huge difference. Um, and so there's no such thing as, as too small of an idea. Um, and uh, we welcome all ideas, big and small.